Greetings everyone and welcome to the channel, Traces of Alien Technologies. Many of us have heard of Nazca Lines and Papa in Peru, and certain images may come to mind. Rocky desert, geometric shapes, some regular, some bizarre, images and lines in the ground, straight lines crossing the horizon. A closer look at the details, however, reveals much more. Satellite imagery shows that sharp shapes are not always there. Many shapes have irregular and broken edges, irregular contours, or no contours at all. Some shapes reveal additional details whose purpose is even more unclear. The more we look at the pictures, the more intrigued we are. There is a great multitude of these shapes and lines in the plateau. These objects must have taken enormous efforts to create. There are so many of them, even for a civilization obsessed with them. This redundancy turns each individual shape into something passing, devoid of individual value. This impression is especially strong when viewing their multi-layered overlapping accumulations. There is no uniformity in their distribution over the plateau. In some places, there are none of them. In others, there are only single objects but many places appear as zones of their accumulation, as if there were some frames on the terrain and the objects had to be squeezed into the frames. If the objects were made by hand, such accumulations with overlays would look absurd. Digging many objects in the same place over and over again, even though other objects were already there, does not make sense. As if a previous object was made and fulfilled its purpose and no longer held the interest of those who built it. Or if the creation of the new ones was more important than the preservation of the old ones. Or if they were needed only at the time they were created. What other options could there be? There are tens of thousands of objects on the plateau. In the past, there were even more, but many simply did not survive. Some of them disappeared with time and only vague fragments remain, while some are now buried underneath the sands. Nowadays, especially in unprotected areas, many are trampled, built over, or plowed down. Creating these objects by hand is a laborious process but it would not require a lot of high-tech tools. Remove the dark surface layer of rocks and soil and stockpile it on the contours of the site you are clearing. The exposed light subsoil will be the body of the site. The contour will be marked by a stockpile ridge, a curb, or piles of soil and rocks. Indeed, when the object is small with a simple shape on flat terrain, creating such an object should not be too hard but the areas of the objects are often hundreds or thousands of square meters and the length of the lines can be kilometers. Many objects' configurations are complicated and the terrain is often irregular. The amount of soil displaced to create some objects should be hundreds of tons. This makes one think about how they were made. Two of the many categories can be easily identified among the objects. One of the two categories would cover most objects as follows. These are made as a trench, with a depth of 10 to 30 centimeters, sometimes up to 50 centimeters. The cross section of the trenches can be regular or arched. The contours are often a continuous curb or separate ridges of piles of soil and stones. Some researchers have studied the subsoil compacted within the bodies of such objects, suggesting that it could have been formed, for example, by intensely walking on them. There is also data from geophysical and geochemical studies showing that up to two meters deep in the soil, electromagnetic structures are identified within the contours of the objects 
including the objects that are no longer seen on the surface. The other category of the objects contains much fewer objects than the first category. These are formed or contoured by group piles or piles of soil or stones on the surface. These objects can easily be divided into subgroups according to some external characteristics. For example, according to the number of component objects in one complex object, many objects are made up of just one element. For instance, lines and stripes, or bands, or lines and bands whose width gradually increases towards the end. The appearance of lines, stripes, or bands can be classified by their width. When the width is about 15 centimeters, the object could be called a thin line. When the width is broader, up to 10 meters or more, one could call it a stripe or a band. The width of this long band changes from 15 to 55 meters. The length of lines and stripes also varies, from several hundred meters to several kilometers. Objects can be as long as tens of kilometers. A band can follow all the irregularities of the terrain, but when viewed from a certain point, it sometimes turns into a regular enough band to fit a beam ruler. Another category is when objects consist of two connected elements. These are long, straight, or more often, broken bands, with an accentuated expansion at the end. They are sometimes several kilometers in length as well. The extension can be in the form of a triangle, or in the form of a strongly elongated trapezoid, or the wide part of a truncated triangle. The transition from the strip to the triangle is often marked by two piles of soil or rocks. The same elements are true for trapezoids. Sometimes the trapezoids have one extra pile of soil and rocks at the wide end. The rectangles have one pile on each of one of the narrow end sides. A broken line connected to a triangle can be in the form of sawtooths with varying degrees of compression. A line may make turns at either a sharp angle or an obtuse angle. The shape of the end blade can be different. Smooth, beveled, arcuate. There are also composite objects divided in the center, as if made of two halves. Another kind of two component objects are lines or bands associated with rectangles. Rectangles, trapezoids, and triangles are never independent objects. There are also objects consisting of several connected elements. These are in the form of several triangles and trapezoids, sequentially connected at a slight angle, an object's narrow end to the other's wider end. As a general rule, one is a larger object and the rest are smaller objects. Often, there is a small rectangular attachment to the end of the object. This also includes objects consisting of three interconnected elements, which are always connected in one sequence that is always the same, a double helix, a broken line, a triangle. The spiral is a fairly common element. There are about a hundred of them. Where a triangle with a broken strip is seen, look for a spiral. A spiral is most often located closer to the end of the triangle. Spirals can be absolutely correct, square and round, as if mathematically verified. But others are not so exact. Some spirals take bizarre forms. Spirals are always double. Spiral lines twist to the center counterclockwise, and having made a full turn in the center, they unwind in the opposite direction. In this case, the lines never intersect or run over each other. The broken lines have various interesting features. As one researcher noted, where a three-part object is located on a plateau with a steep edge, a zigzag is formed by a strip, as if ricocheted from the cliff. The object seems to be trying to fit into the limited space as closely as possible. As with two-part objects, stripes in a three-part objects can also be saw-tooth shapes, 
compressed at various angles, sharp, rounded, rectangular. There are also multi-element combinations of objects. These are accumulations of a variety of one, two, three, or multi-element objects. Often they are located at considerable distance from each other and connected by straight lines. There are so many so-called centers on the plateau, from which stripes radiate in several directions, often associated with other objects. Sometimes the center of these centers is additionally marked by a large stone or a stone mound. Objects that are conventionally designated as panicles or brooms can be categorized as multi-element objects. Imagine a narrow strip laid into a plateau. Here it is divided into many strips of the same width, which, in parallel and without intersecting and not turning away from the general direction, flow as an ensemble across a desert in a close multitude. The width of such a panicle or stream or broom can reach up to 330 meters. Researchers of the Nazca phenomenon describe and map the streams. Catarizing the objects can be based on many other characteristics. For example, by the manner of intersection, breaking the integrity of the contours at the intersection of the objects, or maintaining the integrity of the contours. When a contour's integrity is preserved, one can speculate on the sequence of the stripe's creation. Objects could be categorized by end blade repetition. In the classic version, the end blade consists of one blade or stockpile of rocks and soil, but there are frequently several such stockpiles. They can be both in the form of continuous lines of rocks and soil, or contour-like lines of separate piles of rocks and soil. Some are oriented parallel to the end base, at a small distance from each other. The piles have the same size and volume, but the turp gaps between these piles are too small to allow collecting a sufficient number of rocks to form these piles. Objects can be categorized by the depth of penetration into the ground. Some have the same depth throughout the entire area. Some have fragmentary depth. And some objects have no depth. They are entirely on the surface of the soil. For categorization, no matter what external feature we select, there will always be a number of deviations from it. Next to an object that has neat contour lines and a clear shape is always an incorrect object. Some objects are completely cleared, but others are just covered by separate piles of stones. There is also no system in the arrangement of the piles. The piles made of rocks and soil can be lined outside the boundaries of objects, sometimes at a considerable distance from the objects. The contour of the object can be in the form of a clear, solid blade or stockpile. But sometimes there is only a furrow and no stockpiles. Sometimes there is no furrow or stockpile blades, but there are piles of stone or soil which, when viewed from a certain angle, line up in a logically connected and continuous line. But these moments are best manifested in objects with significant deviations from geometric accuracy. Here's a nearly perfect object, and these are complete opposites. From the perspective of those who consider them the result of manual labor, these objects are not finished. Work on them was stopped for some reason. From the perspective of supporters of high technologies, defects at such objects are evidence of failures or changes in the operation of some airborne devices. These are two extreme points of view, and there are a lot of various theories in between. What kind of object could be considered incorrect? Probably the one whose contours and body are not geometrically irregular, or contain visible gaps like unfinished fragments, or additional redundant details. 
Knowing nothing about the purpose of these objects, about the circumstances of their creation, about which details are intentional and which ones are accidental. We cannot confidentially assert which objects are correct and to what extent. Review of incorrect objects could start with long lines. The eye quickly gets used to their length that can be measured in kilometers as well as their indifference to elevation drops and terrain. Which lines are incorrect? First, those that are not so straight. And certainly the curved lines are incorrect, regardless of whether they possess other features such as a lightened body area and a contour made of stones. Also, long lines sometimes waver a lot. There are also curved sections in places that look like complete misfit because of other parts of the same objects are made quite orderly. With manual execution, such a section could only appear if it was specifically made that way. But here, even a minimal effort would make it possible to do something more correct. The greatest variety of irregularities begins where the lines widen to form triangles or trapezoids. Such objects may have an unfinished appearance and some of their body area is only partly lightened. There are gaps in an almost complete picture. And sometimes they can't even be called gaps because they take up most of the object area. Some lines stretch along the entire length of the object parallel to the lateral sides, the so-called median lines. Here are two objects with visible spaces side by side, one of them with median lines, the other without them. That is to say, median lines are not mandatory. Some suggest that these are the preliminary marking lines required to create a geoglyph. But more often than not, there are too many of them for such purposes. Their width is too large for marking lines. In addition, they have contours and a lightened body area, which is also redundant for marking purposes. Irregular rectangles show that no median lines were applied when they were created. Thus, median lines are much more like complete standalone elements that appear inside a non-lightened body area of the object. Objects can be categorized as follows. Those with a fully lightened body area, those with a partially lightened body area but with independent lines visible in the non-lightened gaps, and those with a lightened line along the contour of the object while the body of the object is not lightened and other lines can be seen. Apart from the median lines, there are also central or axial lines. These are strips that run along the object's axis and extend far beyond the object. It is not uncommon for several trapezoids or rectangles to form on the axial line. Some stripes are directed toward the hills, and at the top of the hill, their form and direction change. Objects with fragmentary sideway deviations are also common, which make the object asymmetrical along the axis. The same is true for the objects with side attachments. Here is a good example of how it should be without the attachments. And here, there is clearly the beginning of some activities, then their interruption, then a sudden continuation. There is no point in making a solid and even contour line in the middle of the object to then push it toward the edge of the object. And this trapezoid, in order to be symmetrical and correct, should be properly expanded in the right and left parts. But the most incorrect are rectangular objects. For instance, one of the sides suddenly bends, or the contour is doubled or the contour becomes intermittent. There is a great variety of irregularities and often many combinations thereof. Part of the irregular category, there is a group of shapeless objects. There are many of those. In addition to the deformed body shape of the object, the contours are also uneven, intermittent, and fragmentary. Among the shapeless objects are small objects, the size of a few tens of meters. There are also large ones, about a hundred meters long. 
Many of them tend to fit within the terrain slope configurations. Most of the large shapeless objects are located at the foot of hills or slopes rather than at the top of them. It seems that on a flat area this object would be a regular rectangle, but something didn't quite work right. Here is a feature typical for a rectangle, piles of stones at the end sides. Such objects could spread over an impressive area, capturing both flat areas and small hills. There is a scope, but it seems that neither a leveled platform nor a neat contour was the purpose. Objects with double contour lines are a separate category. No mistakes in markup or other objective reasons can explain them. Only one thing remains, to admit that this is how it was intended. Imagine two crews diligently laying lines of stockpile of stones parallel to each other along the double markings carefully plotted and advanced by their foreman. Here, one more interesting detail. There are places where irregular objects are not so many, and their formlessness is fragmentary. And there are places where there are many of them, and they are recklessly shapeless and numerous. Pile objects is another category of irregular objects. On such sites, there are groups of piles of soil and stones. Objects with contours of rows of piles are in the same category. There are many theories surrounding such objects. From uncleared garbage after area stripping the body of a geoglyph, to a hidden divine message for future generations. A pile contour is found in all types of objects, but more often in rectangles, trapezoids, and triangles. And for the formless objects, the pile fragmentary contour is an absolute rule. Piles can cover either an insignificant part of an object or its entire area. No dependence could be found for the number of piles on the body of an object, to the object's size, shape, direction, or other characteristics. Under the manual labor theory, it is impossible to guess the motives behind creating a certain set of piled end blades instead of one continuous one. In most cases, piles are located randomly, but there are also examples when they stretch in straight rows. Sometimes there is one straight row of piles on the body of an object and it bifurcates. Sometimes a group of piles at the beginning of the trapezoid transforms into a straight row of piles. There are examples when piles cover the entire body of an object, the shape of which is vague and its contours are solid. There are many examples when the body of an object itself cannot be distinguished but compact groups of piles give out that it was here. There are instances when a clean object is superimposed on a piled object and the piles remain intact. And then there are just miraculous instances where a piled object is overlapped by another piled object so that one can tell which piles belong to which object. As we can see, it is hard to determine the purpose and the reasons for the objects based solely on their appearance. The regular signs provide fewer answers than the deviations from them. This usually happens when clearly visible, but essentially secondary moments are studied, and those that influence their creation or appearance that should be taken into account are missed. It is clear that there are such missed moments. These conditions that caused various elements and the tasks that were involved with their help in most cases are incomprehensible. Their root cause and what forced them into consideration are unknown, as unknown is what was received as a result. For example, stripes can overlap and intersect, blending paths and details, but some contours can be preserved allowing the sequence of appearance to only be guessed. Rectangular shapes are perpendicular to the axis of triangles and trapezoids. The bases of the triangles in three-part objects, as a rule, are directed toward river valleys. The triangle in such objects connects to a zigzag line at a sharp angle. 
In two-part combinations of triangles and broken lines, the connection can take on different appearances. The angles of the triangle's expansion does not exceed 17 degrees. The overwhelming majority of objects are located on flat areas of the plateau or on flat hilltops. Where the object is located on a slope, its wider part is lower than the narrow part. The list goes on and on. There are also cases when the incorrect shape of an object or regular terrain, when viewed from a certain height or angle, becomes correct. For example, the corner of a triangle or a trapezoid, when it's superimposed on the edge of a ravine, gully, or small hill, can deform and stretch along the slope. But looking at it from a certain point from above the ground, it also turns out to be correct. This point is located about 5 meters from the object, and even so, is not directly above it, but almost reaching it at a slight inclination of the plane of view. Thus, in all of these instances, a projection onto the terrain of some impact is reflected onto the surface in the form of a geometric shape and its distortions. It is difficult to determine why and how ancient people would do such things, to make huge projections of geometric shapes over regular terrain while at the same time scrupulously conveying the details for distortions. Unless they follow the ritual to worship some deity of geometry. There are also other instances where an object fits into the terrain's irregularity in a fragmentary manner. For example, this line is over 4 kilometers long. Changing direction four times at higher elevations, it continues towards mountainous terrain and there it expands to 7 meters in width, imprinting only the middle and end parts of the triangle on the surface areas where the elevation is at the same level. When the lines intersect with curved lines on the plateau, you can see something similar. Here, the thin lines do not reach the bottom of the wider band, as if what left them on the surface was programmed for a fixed depth of impact. Interesting moments also appear in cases where the stripe is on top of thin lines. For example, in this area the first two and fourth lines are slightly visible. The fifth is much more visible, and the extreme one is not touched at all. To understand why this occurred, it is worth comparing the changes on the surface with the fluctuations in the relief. Where the thin line tracks are completely leveled by the water band, the relief is the same. The third line is less visible, and the surface elevation there is slightly raised. The fifth line is already visible. The elevation is back. And at the sixth line, the elevation drops by almost a meter, leaving the thin line's track practically unaffected. Furthermore, the elevation drops and the wider band continues on it, now with a barely noticeable contour. And here the elevation becomes the same as the beginning and the wider band takes on the same form as where the measurements began. The elevation drop was about 4 meters. In the intersection with the thin lines, the elevation drop is about a meter. The wider band's depth of impact on the ground surface was maintained throughout, changing the intersection traces depending on elevation level. The impact continued, but given the elevation drop, the impact affected the ground to a lesser depth. At the same time, the source of the impact would have always been at the same height above the ground, because the wide band has the same neat shape as the same elevation height mark on both sides of the valley. It looks like the source of the impact caused a constant effect on the ground surface, and it appears that there was a dependence on its force on the height above the surface and there were changes in its intensity. Thus, some of the inaccuracies are more likely a result of a programmed impact on the ground surface rather than the carelessness of some builders. Position height above the surface, directional impact, and programmed intensity of impact are quite specific conditions. They set a rigid framework beyond which it is pointless to seek an answer. Terrain objective, it is impossible to ignore them. To solve the first of them, position height above the surface, both balloons and kites have already been proposed. 
Fortunately, the winds that prevail there could also help these theories. Another option, towers, like the one that is currently used to view the plateau, or platforms flooring on poles that could be set and reset. For someone in charge, watching from above, to direct the work and ordinary workers, follow his instructions, carry stones. These options are not bad. With their help, it could be possible to closely explain the issues, such as those related to complex markings or projection distortions. But they do not provide answers to questions about directional impact and intensity of impact. They do not explain reasons for the overcrowding accumulations of objects or the reasons behind the irregularities and diversity of object forms. Still, one of the main questions remains unanswered. Why? The Bezier spline, or curve, seen in the angles of turns of many lines and in spirals, cannot be explained by these options. Many researchers have been discussing this for a long time in detail. To plot a Bezier spline on a flat surface, something needs to go over the surface at a certain speed while changing direction. Platform towers are not mobile enough to leave such traces. Balloons and kites do not leave traces deep enough for the long term on the surface. And it is possible that someone added Bezier splines along these means. It turns out that we should be talking about something that could control its motion above the ground at variable heights and with certain speeds, leaving traces of programmed variable parameters on the surface and in the ground. In line with this approach, answers to many questions could be sought after. For example, the ease with which in places of congestion, old objects are overlapped and replaced by newer ones. There is no point in keeping old traces intact. Abundance and variety of irregularities are also explained simply. If the appearance of the object is not the purpose, but something secondary, if no one has worked to make it look in a certain way, then there can be no other result. The object will be formed by other factors, including random ones, such as irregular terrain elevation. It is surprisingly easy to consider the bulk of the objects as modifications of stripes and bands. That is, variations in width, configuration, depth, profile section, radial expansion, and trapezoidal expansion are all the result of variable intensity and impact direction on the surface. Suddenly the question, why was it created, could also disappear. This does not apply to traces. These cannot be traces of the source itself, but traces of its intended interaction with the surface. The emphasis, however, shifts to a somewhat different realm, one much more intriguing and vague, having to do with the nature and meaning of the impact itself. And here, in the continuous background of irrelevant and casual events, details suddenly emerge that could only appear as a result of programmed, purposeful action. The fact that many drawings on the plateau can be viewed in detail only from a height has been known for a long time and does not cause much controversy. They even built a special tower for tourists so that it would be more convenient to view them. All drawings convey images of animals and plants as well as objects that are difficult to understand. There are no anthropomorphic drawings among them, and in this they differ from petroglyphs. In general, petroglyphs are easy to distinguish. They have a lot of dead-end details, drawn in one pass in one direction and then breaking off. Petroglyphs are clearly visible from small hills and even from the ground. Some drawings also have a closed contour, and this makes it seem that they exist on their own, but it has not always been the case. For example, a drawing called Nine Fingers has a closed path, but there is a line nearby. Maybe only a few stones, and now the drawing is already paired with the nearby line. Many of them, however, are shown in photographs, films, and sketches as something away from the background. A standalone representation of drawings cannot be correct, because the line that made the drawing does not end on it, it continues outside. The connected line shows that a drawing is a multi-part object, 
usually containing a triangular extension. Altogether, it ends up being a three-part object, with the line pattern changing where the three-part object contains a spiral. The spiral themselves are not ideal in shape. There are even eight-shape or infinity-shape spirals, which in and of itself is more of a drawing. In the drawing titled Monkey, the tail is in fact a double spiral. Three-part objects with drawings and three-part objects with spirals have similarities and differences. The similarity is, for example, that these drawings are treated in the same way as the rest of the objects. Some of them are crossed out by other lines and stripes, and some are overlapped by other objects. The similarity is that they also have no standard size. Their size ranges from 15 to 400 meters. There are no standards for the line width with which the drawings are made. The drawing line width ranges from 30 centimeters to 3 meters. As a result, the already familiar feeling emerges that such parameters are insignificant and secondary. There are such features, albeit not many. One of them has already been mentioned. The drawings always take the place of a spiral in objects that we have categorized as three-part objects. And this feature is always there. In addition, spirals in the three-part objects, as a rule, are not preceded by anything. But if there is a drawing in place of the spiral, then the drawing is preceded by a broken line. And to make a drawing in the three-part object instead of a spiral would still require some additional reasons. In drawings and spirals, the ones which have smooth turns and 180-degree turns are Bezier curves. A researcher formulated the drawings of a spider as follows. A spider is practically one Bezier curve, more correctly, a Bezier spline, without circles and straight lines. But in pictures, turns are not only rounded. They are also sharp corners and rectangular corners. In any event, the drawings are part of three-part objects. This is all the same stripe that made the three-part objects. There is also another impression this gives off, albeit a not-so-technical one. There is a cocky hipsterism in these drawings, like, how about if I draw this? As if someone signed it in one stroke and moved on. This would be a very human attribute. The theme of the drawings is also indicative. Plants, fish, animals, birds. There is not the slightest hint of severed heads or other cruel ritual depictions. And there is one more difference of a dynamic nature. While long lines and shapes are traces of programmed alternating impacts during a long linear movement of the source, then drawings and spirals are unlikely to fit that definition. Drawings and spirals may appear to have been made carelessly and, apparently, without reckoning in terms of long-term admiration, but they do not look like they were made in the process of linear movement. To make such a compact ligature of lines, one would need to spend some time over this spot. Whatever made all of these Nazca objects, it was not very high above the surface and was actively interacting with it. What was the product? Anything can be assumed here. It is possible that the movement itself was the product, but in the same way, it is possible that they were interested in the ground material. The volume of soil removed from an object is simply enormous. It can amount to hundreds of tons. Moreover, the volume of soil left in the contours of such an object is an order of magnitude less. This is clearly visible even when simply comparing stripes with different widths. They have different areas and the volume of the contours is the same. Under the manual labor theory, this would be easily explained by the fact that extra rocks were simply tossed. But tossing would not work. In overlays, all objects, both new and remnants of those that are overlapped by them, are cleaned in the same manner. If stones were tossed, the overlapped objects would be covered with stones. It means the stones were carried from somewhere far away. But here's where we end up in conflict with this logic. Trying to not fill up the remains of objects that you are destroying by constructing a new one in their place is an absurdity. There is one more thing worth mentioning. When you compare maps of the locations of objects on the plateau, it appears that there are places when there are more objects of some type than others. 
and in other places, this type is not there at all. For example, here is a location map for the trapezoids. Here is a map for the three part ones, those with the spiral element. Here is a map for pile objects. Likewise, other types of objects are selectively accumulated in locations on the plateau. Rectangles, irregular objects, objects with median lines, and other forms. This is the rule for accumulations, applicable to all types of objects. Therefore, some basic conditions are reflected in it, but their root cause, as in cases with other conditions, is unknown. This is the manifestation of the same circumstance that was previously noted in both the regular rules and configurations chapters. It consists in the fact that the appearance of such an object to place under circumstances that are unobvious and insignificant for us. It used what we do not use. It was interested in what does not attract us. And the result was something we couldn't lift a finger for. But at the same time, everything combined formed a conglomerate that is capable of striking the imagination. The question is, why, when, and how? We'll talk about how it works in the following chapters.